Boris Haglin was born on July 2nd, 1892, a Russian-born Swedish engineer responsible for numerous cipher machines. He began working in the cryptology field in 1922 alongside Arvid Dam for AB Cryptograph. Haglin improved on the Dam device and added a pinwheel to control the two coding wheels, creating more variation, but not this kind of pinwheel. Noted U.S. crypto pioneer William Friedman visited the Haglund plant in Sweden in the early 1930s, but they didn't meet until Haglund visited Washington seven years later. After that, William Friedman and Boris Haglund became lifelong best friends. Haglund then developed the C-35 for the French Army, which combined the pinwheel concept with that of a coin change machine. Haglund visited Washington again in 1939 with a prototype C-35. After the German invasion of Denmark and Norway, he and his wife traveled through Berlin, Vienna, and Genoa, carrying machine prototypes and manufacturing plans. They caught the last steamer from Italy to the US and spent the duration of World War II here. This led to the invention of the improved C-36. The C-36 was demonstrated to the US Army and William Friedman, but unfortunately it was rejected for being too insecure. Friedman wrote that the machine itself was secure, but it was too easily misused in the field. Haglund continued working on the C-36 concept, which led to the invention of the C-38. The US Army liked the C-38 and bought the rights to the patent and changed the name to what we now know as the M209. There aren't many of these around, but at the National Cryptologic Museum, they have quite the collection. Let's take a look. We're in door 15, a part of the museum that the public doesn't normally get to see. And we're going to start with the M209, which is actually the end of the evolution of this type of machine. Mm -hmm. So we have the M209 right here. Now, this is probably the most numerous of all the uh, U.S. cryptographic devices. Right. Uh, it was used by the Army. This would be the Army version right here. You can tell by the green. The Navy would have been the CSP 1500. That would have been a lighter blue color. Um, but to tell that story, we also need to go into the story of Boreas Hagelin and Arvid Dam. So we'll start here with the dam device. So this device right here, it's kind of a fun play on words, right. but um, the dam device right here, this is just a single rotor device that would have been used for enciphering. So he would have just, it's all mechanical, it's just a little stepping switch, all he would have done is just turned it and it would have been used to encode messages. And there's no electronics in it or electrical? No electronics in it at all. Roughly, it started about roughly 100 years ago, so okay. before they really had the means to make something like that. Um, but this would lead into Boris Haglin and how they work together. So Haglin actually would have been working with the company. He wasn't really in like a manufacturing role at that point. But Arvid Dam would be off in the country working on marketing his devices. Mm -hmm. And while he was away, the French would reach out and they would ask for a cryptographic device of their own. And this would become the B-21. So Haglin was an engineer. He was an engineer. He was capable of doing it, but at the time, he wasn't really in that role in the gotcha. company. So we don't have a B-21 here. It simply would have been similar to an Enigma. It would have just had light bulbs to okay. pop the letters. Keyboard just like this one here. You press the letter, the light pops up. We do have the B-211. The B-211 was the upgraded model. You can see it's got a paper tape printer attached to it here. And it's the same concept. You just press the letters, and then it would print out the message that way. So Haglin would continue to evolve these devices. Mm -hmm. It would go to the C-35, and then it would go to the C-36, which we do have here. Um, and you can see this one's just a simple rotor device. It's got five rotors this time, and you can see all five of them here. Tape devices now changed. You can see how it shifted from this gizmo here right. to this here. Made it a little easier, made it more compact. And this is something he would have tried to market to a uh -huh. bunch of people, but it, it wasn't as secure, I guess okay. is the best way to say it, as some of the other models. Um, this would go on until he got to the C-38. And you can see the difference between the C-38 and this one. This one does have keys, so it would lock and the ability to shut it. So it's sort of like a chain of command way. Mm -hmm. So these keys actually, and it's hard to see, but they do have little notches on them. So one will have one notch, one will have two notches, so that someone in the field would use just the one notch to open it, and they wouldn't be able to change the rotors. But someone in the higher chain of command right. would have the two notch one, and they'd be able to open it up, switch out the rotors, things like that. The U.S. military would see this, see the use of it, uh -huh. and then that would become the M209. They would buy the patent, and this is what the M209 originally came from. So it kind of tells that story of how it progressed up right. to the M209. And it didn't have to be 
that secure. It wasn't as secure as, as an Enigma, for example. Wait, what? Why would a crypto device not need to be secure? Plus, who became the first and only person to become a millionaire from cryptology? Find out the answers to these burning questions and more in our next episode. Thank you.